But what we're going to do is we have uh, two microphones, and if you have a question, uh, Steve Edwards is going to, no, no, I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, he's coming up later, but we have, oh, Ken, but ladies first. Yes, ma'am. And uh, uh, <laughs> we'll just take as many as we can tonight and, um, and see if, if I can get more than two done. Oh, wow, we've got a lineup of young people. Okay, I'm ready. Okay, Sarah. So Hello, I'm, I'm... I am Sarah Tibble. Um, so I have an evangelism question. I have a friend who is really hung up on like humanitarian efforts. So she's really passionate about the Native Americans and she basically her question is she can't convince herself that they basically have been lost the entire time they've been in North America. So she struggles with um, justifying that. So she's caught up on that. And I wonder how you evangelize to someone that believes in God but can't um, or doesn't know how to deal with the people that have been lost and didn't hear about Jesus from like missionaries until the recent decade or centuries. So basically what you're saying, Sarah, is are the uh, people that have never heard lost? The Native Americans are one of them, right? Um, so are the uh, Native Americans, and we would add, uh, you know, the Aborigines, uh, the Pygmies, um, you know, the, the Inuits or whatever the Eskimos are, you know what I mean. All of the kind of very distant uh, people groups. Because um, they're all uh, Aborig, I shouldn't even write these down, I don't even know how to spell Aborigines. There, that's phonetically. Are they lost? So, uh, uh, and, and how do we, how do we respond to that? Because this is a common question people have. So that is a wonderful question. And uh, yes, they are. Okay, the, the <laughs> and I'll come back to it in just a second since you sat down. Okay, Ken. I'm Ken Pruitt. Uh, my question is actually pretty easy. I just wonder if we as a congregation might have an update on the searches for a technical director and for worship ministries so we can know how uh, to pray more effectively. Amen. Thanks, Ken. Yes, we have the, the worship director. So where did you go, John? Where did you go? Backstage. Oh, he's backstage. Back there somewhere is the worship director search committee, and I get the minutes and everything, but I'm not sure. Oh, well, there comes his wife, I bet. He's coming right behind. John, we've had a, a request for an update, and while you're thinking about what you want to say, the tech director update, uh, we've interviewed two or three, and uh, I've heard lots of stuff, but I don't know exactly what the final work, come on up here. You can even sing if you want. I'm not going to. <clears throat> there. Ooh. Wow, power. Can I play with that too? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I'll break it. <laughs> okay, uh, this is, uh, we don't have a real long update. We started uh, uh, in October, I believe it was. We had about, uh, we put out uh, the uh, ad on the internet for the position and we had about 25 applicants and we've whittled that down. We're down to... Uh, two, maybe three uh, applicants right now that are looking very good, and so we're moving forward with those. Um, the committee is going to, has to go and uh, observe one of the, uh, the uh, worship directors, and we're trying to juggle schedules <laughs> so we can get to do that, but we're, we anticipate doing that in the next uh, month or so, and then uh, returning to the board with a recommendation uh, a panel so that they can pick and, uh, well, interview them themselves and continue the process. So that's where we're at on that. Thanks for asking, Ken. Do they know who the committee is? Oh, <laughs> don't ask me names. Oh. <laughs> I freeze in front of people and I forget names. We have, let's see, Karen Rowland and Dave Bartholomew and uh, myself and uh, Marcia Visser and uh, Dennis. Dennis Root. And Mark Duncan. And Mark Duncan, yes. Don't want to forget Mark. Okay. And you're a blessing. And, and uh, you can want to say anything else? No, I'm done. Okay. <laughs> and, and as far, thank you, John, so much. And John is also the vice chairman of the uh, elders and also on the praise team and choir and everything else. But one more thing on the tech director for you to know, Ken, 
after we started looking, we found out that it was misnomered, that uh, we called it a media director and found out that out in the real world, media director means kind of an artist and uh, a video person, not primarily what we needed, lights and sound booth. And so the, the job title was changed from media director to tech director at Mark's uh, advice, Mark Duncan. He said that the primary thing we need is to be heard and seen and not primarily be producing like uh, Dan Smith was kind of like, if you all remember Dan Smith, he could do anything. He could animate, he could make art, a lot of the slides uh, he did. And, and we decided that you can't, it's kind of like hiring Leonardo da Vinci. You know what I mean? It's better to focus in on someone that can do the tech. And so we've interviewed two or three, and I believe uh, that Mark and uh, Duncan and Dave Scott are in charge of that. So I just hear after they're done. Is that a good enough answer for you? Good. Yep. And so just keep praying. I mean, they're all plodding along and interviewing and, and uh, keeping. There is a subset of the elders uh, called the SSSC, Strategic Sub Staffing Committee, uh, that, uh, let, let's see, Dwayne is on. I see Rod, I saw a minute ago. Rod is on that, uh, and I'm on that. And uh, they handle the job descriptions, and that's where the process, where it got more clarified. So, thank you, Ken. Yes, sir. Hello, I'm. Hi, I'm Jordan, uh, and I have a question. Um, did Joseph lead some of the Egyptians to God, or did he marry a believer? Now, say that again. I don't have my little thing here that I can hear you in. Did Joseph lead some of the Egyptians to God, or did he marry a believer? Ah, that's a good question, Jordan. Uh, did Joseph... In Genesis, in Egypt, uh, lead uh, his wife to the Lord or marry a pagan? That is a good question. Okay. Dory, I don't know if I'm going to get through with these two, but yeah, Dory. Can we save it for... It's going to be kind of not exactly long, but I want to ask about 2 Kings 2. And, well, my New King James Bible put these two parts together, but they do kind of fit. But it's where Elijah with the S, he, uh, it says he performs miracles, but it's where he healed the water in the city. And that part of it was not my first uh, reason I wanted to ask this question, but then it says in verse 23, then he went up from there to Bethel, and as he was going up the road, some youths came from the city and mocked him and said to him, go up, you bald head, go up, you bald head, and I'm not making fun of bald headed guys because I'm married to one. <laughs> so he turned around and looked at them and pronounced a curse on them in the name of the Lord, and two female bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the youths. Then he went from there to Mount Carmel, and from there he returned to Samaria. But I guess what I'm wondering is, in King James, I think it says, I'm bringing out the artillery, I got my parallel. In King James, it actually says, and there came forth two she-bears out of the wood and tear forty and two of them. Uh, I think one of the other translations said that they actually got killed. But, okay, and maul. Yeah, the word maul is like uh, to handle roughly bruise or tear, or actually like the maul, it's a tool, which kind of probably looks like a sledgehammer with an axe head, a long-handled tool. But, but if there were 42 injured, there were probably more kids. Now, are they young kids? or a bunch of pagan fraternity guys? Were, they, were there any Hebrew kids? I guess what I wonder too is, Elisha had a right to, to pronounce a curse on them because nobody wants to be ganged up on. And it says he was bald, we don't know how old he was, but he was probably a little bit older. And even if it was grade school kids, a whole bunch of them ganging up on him, that wouldn't be right. But. I do know in the Old Testament, there's places where people 
mocked and ridiculed and like King David when the guy was yelling at him and throwing rocks and, and when he was leaving town. And then when Hannah was crying at the altar and moving her lips and Eli was calling her a drunk and she answered him, you know, honestly not, but she didn't return, you know, ugliness for being treated roughly. And I know in the New Testament, Jesus says, if people curse you, you should bless them. And there's a place where the disciples wanted to call down fire, but he's like, no, don't do that. But um, on the other hand, it was kind of divine comeuppance. Uh, so I guess in today's world, any career gets picked on and nobody's immune in American society. I mean, pastors are, people like to pick on pastors, but I, I guess, you know, could, a, could somebody call down on a curse? Be, and I think my, one of my Bibles said something about because Elisha represented the true and living God and he was speaking for God and, and these were pagan people picking on him that God zapped him. Well, the two she bears, but, and I'm sure it was divine, but on the other hand, were they outside the outskirts of town and where, the, where it's not safe, so there's dangerous animals. But also, too, when it, in the original Bible, well, in my, my New King James, it hooks healing of the water with this. And you would think, now it doesn't say how fast the water got healed, but it just said he healed the water, and from then on the water was good. And the land, it was no longer barren. It kind of implies almost that the water was toxic because it affected the humans. So if the guy fixed your water, why would you be picking on him? And I'm Dory. Hello, I'm Dory. Oh, I'm Dory Eric. Yeah, I didn't want them to miss that because <laughs> that is the world's longest question and we well, appreciate I, that. <laughs> uh, well, one thing, I have wondered about this for a long time and I, if you notice, there's a Mother's Day application here. There's two she-bears and there's a Father's Day application. Don't pick on your bald-headed dad. Love them, but also, there's a ton of good material here for a youth group sermon, and I've never heard this preached on. Amen. Okay. And, and so, Dory is a blessing. Can you tell, have you seen anybody else that comes with two Bibles, one sheet? Oh, this and, one's been uh, bugging me. Oh, and by the way, the word mall, okay, now, this is a real old dictionary, but it even had the word M-A-L-L. -L, but anyway, it comes from Middle English, Old French, Latin, Malleus, which means hammer. So that's where that word is derived from. But so to be mauled is where you get really bruised up, smashed, punched down. But I would imagine whoever these she bears were, there were probably some dead kids. And, and I had a lot of brothers, so I could see kids doing this. <laughs> were there a few Hebrew kids doing that too? I mean, we, it doesn't say, I doubt it, but they might have. Okay. Dory, you are fun, and Dory is one of our Wednesday night uh, BC and Deers, and I'm so used to her. her, her uh, in fact, you asked a question about Second Kings last month. I love these. Old I know. I remember. Okay, several things. One thing is, I mean, Dory, you heard all of this stuff. Uh, basically, Elisha uh, was the the. Pri I mean, as long as we've talked so long about this, and you have to be patient. I'll be. Uh, Verma, I'll be back in a second. I don't know if I'll ever be back because I have two more, but you can rest for a second and then, because I don't want to wonder about your question and worry. Uh, but Elisha, remember um, Elijah succeeded by Elisha. It was one of the dark times in the children of Israel. They had gone to the, the worship of false gods in the Northern Kingdom. You know all of that stuff. This was near the end of the Northern Kingdom. Um, the, if you remember that Elijah had been approached uh, in First Kings by contingents of soldiers. And you, you know, Dory was saying, how come the Lord, uh, you know, says turn the other cheek in the New Testament, how come, uh, you know, he is sending bears to maul youths in the Old Testament? Well, Elijah, when the, the groups of soldiers came, the squads of soldiers, uh, they were burned up by fire. So we have to see, this is a climactic time in the history of Israel showing who is representing the Lord as they're going into idolatry. Uh, if you study, Dory, in, your, in your, all of your sources there, youths does not mean, we're not talking about 
sweet, smiling little middle schooler singing or, you know, you know, Marsha Visser's We Praisers or anything in between. Basically, if you remember, you could not be uh, a priest until you're 30. You couldn't be uh, a Levite until, I mean, it's all in the Old Testament. You can look all these up. Uh, that's why Jesus began his ministry at about the age 30. Uh, you couldn't be a, a helper in the Levitical area until you're 25. And before that, what they called you from this time period down is you were a youth. You were not yet old enough to hold either a Levitical help job or a priestly job. And by the way, uh, the priest could only serve until they're uh, about 55 years old. Boy, that sounds almost like you live in France or something. Uh, and so there was a time period here where about 25 years of hard work or 30 for the um, Levites, but those below that. So don't think, um, you know, single digit age people or even, you know, helpless little middle schoolers. Uh, these, were, these were college age kids, most likely, and they were mocking. And they were mocking the representative of God. And so that's what you're reading here. He turned around, he looked at them, he pronounced a curse on them in the name of the Lord. And basically all he said is, Lord, basically it's vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And I think the lesson for us to learn here is that we're not supposed to take vengeance on people. He just said, Lord, you see what they're doing to your name, do whatever you want, which is what David did. Uh, and, and David says, the Lord returned to Shimei. Uh, you know, if the Lord sent him, I need it, but if not, and you remember Shimei, as well as everybody else involved in bad things with David, even though David never responded, Solomon did. And, and all of them were eradicated, Joab, all of that clan of people. So what, what we're seeing here is when you are attacking the prophet, uh, the representative, the spokesman of God, God has this level of respect uh, that is due. Uh, he, he sent these bears and uh, they mauled and you can imagine it must have been quite a sight for 42, but if you think about it, this mocking crowd coming toward this elderly prophet was an ominous thing. 42 young people, a gang of young people. Look what goes on in our country. Uh, you know, the hammerings in New York City right now and everything else. And so this was a preservation of the prophet of the Lord. And he just said, Lord, you take care of them. And the Lord took care of them. As far as, uh, and Dora, you ask so many questions at my age, I can hardly remember them. But uh, basically the, the, the healing of the springs, uh, that is not a singular. Remember, Moses did the same thing. When the bitter waters at Marah were there, he threw in a piece of wood. And here, uh, Elisha throws in a, um, uh, they brought him the salt and he throws it in. And it remains healed to this day, uh, which uh, was down there in, in uh, the time, probably, it depends on who was codifying this, probably Ezra or someone else, and they said it's still clean water. But, but just to the whole Second Kings thing, it's a warning to not be disrespectful. That's why even the Apostle Paul, when we get to the book of Acts, and, and there's a group of mocking priests that, that were having him slapped and he said, God smite you, you whitewashed wall. And they said, you're talking to the high priest and Paul immediately stops because he knew that no matter who is filling the office, even if it's a president we don't like or a whoever we don't like, you respect the office. And he said, thou shalt not speak evil, Paul said, of the ruler of thy people in the book of Acts. So it was God reminding the children of Israel in the northern kingdom, remember that's where Elijah and Elisha are ministering, in the northern half that was apostatizing. They were the representatives of the living and true God. Uh, they held the prophetic office and spoke for God. They were the ones that revealed God to the people. These are not teenagers uh, at the high, I mean, they're probably either older teenagers or college age, under 25ers, and the curse is actually an expression of the vengeance of God. And uh, what, what he is saying is, Lord, if you want to, um, you handle them, and the Lord did right away. And the Lord protected his servant. So 
that's all I'd say from all the times I read it, but I don't have as many books as you have, Dory, but is that good enough? That's good, yeah. You're a blessing. I can't wait till next time's Second Kings question. Uh, but let's run back before we go to Verma. Uh, we, I guess we have two. We have Sarah's way back here too. So I'll start with Sarah since she was first. And this question is probably one of the most common questions that you get. In fact, for years I spoke at, at college events. Uh, I used to go out, uh, in fact, I started the question and answer at the University of Tulsa. And they start at about 10.30 at night. I mean, the kids, the college kids would all just be awake and, and they would have these, these big meetings at 10.30 at night and I would go there and do question and answer. And I could hardly stay awake, you know, but that's when college kids come alive. And this would be almost a regular question. And I thought, why don't you listen at all the other meetings? You know, but that's okay, they just ask. So basically, are the people, what Sarah's asking, she was uh, framing it with her friend, uh, but it's a much larger question. Are there people that have never heard? So, so are there people, uh, that's the first question, are there people that have never heard from the living and true uh, God, that, that's a question uh, to think about, who have never, I mean, they are absolutely uh, clueless that there is a true and living God, okay? So that, that's part of this question. And secondly, if there are people, are some of them, the Native Americans, the Eskimos, the Aborigines, these are modern ones, and what about all the people that in the time of the apostles and prophets lived in the heart of Africa? And I doubt Paul made it there. So, from Paul's lifetime preaching the gospel, if no one from Jerusalem made it to the heart of Africa, are those people, is it fair, is it right that those people will be consigned to an eternal, painful, conscious torment in hell. See, that's, that's really the question. It's really a question about is hell, is hell really, I mean, like our pastor from Grand Rapids said, you know, God wins, he loves, he's not gonna send anybody to hell. Is that what the Bible says? So, Sarah, thanks for asking that. So, how would I answer that? Um, Let's see, I gotta get my other, there we go. I need a fresh page here. I would answer that by stringing together what it says in Acts 17, Romans 1, and Psalm 19. And basically, and you could use a lot of others, uh, if you wanna know about uh, you know, who's gonna be in hell, the Lord tells us who's going there. And so we can, even uh, cover that. But let's start in Psalm 19, and I'll show you just the reasoning uh, behind how to answer that. And the Bible was not written in the format of like uh, an encyclopedia of answers to questions. It's more of a revelation of the character and person of God and with illustrations in the lives of people. But we can, uh, and Paul did. Remember, this whole reason we're doing this on Sunday night is because in Acts uh, 19, Paul has q and A's like we're having. But look at chapter 19 of the book of Psalms. And what it's talking about is the, the natural revelation of God, the, the general revelation of God through nature, through creation. And what he says is in verse one, the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork. Um, day and today to our speech, night and tonight it reveals knowledge. So what it's talking about is creation is declaring there's a true and living God, a creator. So God says that. God says, my creation is declaring the reality of who I am. Now look at what verse three says. So that's 19, one and two, that, that all of creation is declaring, and I know that, you know, you all know this, but if I saw my iPhone on the ground, if I saw an iPhone on the ground, and I looked at that, either I could date the dirt around it and try and figure out what time period in the geological column it's from and, and think about how many billions of years it took for 
this unique glass touch screen and the, I don't even know what it's made of, aluminum maybe, to all come from different parts of the world and form perfectly. And lithium to get inside to make the battery or whatever. Or I could think some person dropped that thing. But yet that same logic doesn't work with most people with, with creation. Creation is far more complex than the iPhone. I mean, if you know anything about uh, our human bodies and, and the way that our human bodies work, and, and if you know anything about the complexity of even how our brains use so little electricity for 9,000 times more powerful computing than anything we even know how to make, our brains use so little amounts of electricity, and the Lord designed them that way. It shows design. So the heavens are and the earth and, and nature and the hydrological system and every other scientific wonder shows the signature of God. But now look at verse three. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Now we're getting into it. God says that his signal, the natural or general revelation the, the, the revelation from nature to all of humanity, this kind of um, dim light, kind of like uh, when the lights went out in second service, there was just enough light that we could see how to go and how to find a way out. God has, through nature, turned the lights on just that amount for every human being. And there's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard, their line has gone out, verse four, through all the earth, their words to the end of the world. In them he set a tabernacle for the sun, he goes through. And so he's talking there about the, the general revelation. Then he goes to specific, look at verse seven. Then he's saying that, that general revelation, so there's a, there are two, aspects here that we have to understand. There's special revelation. That's the word of God. Then there's general revelation. He says the, the special revelation is the law of the Lord. It's perfect and it converts the soul. That's what brings people to salvation. So then we know this. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Romans 10. We know that. But what the Lord has done is, it's kind of like when you ride airplanes, they say, if the airplane is crashing and if we're headed down, the, the, there's gonna be little dim lights in the aisle that you can follow to an exit door. That always comforts me. You know, have you ever been in a plane crashing? You know, I've been on one that was starting to have something go wrong. Nobody was thinking of anything. Stuff was falling out of the bins. The oxygen masks were all like octopuses flying all over the place. Nobody was looking down at those dim lights. But if you did look down at the dim lights, you could follow them somewhere, but probably you'd get crushed. But the general revelation is God saying, you're crashing, there, there is a dim you know, pathway that if you want to know, you can follow it. And then if you want to know that, then you'll get the special revelation. So that's, that's Psalm uh, 19. Now what happens, go to Romans 1. What I like here is the Apostle Paul is addressing this very same question. Because people, people have always wondered this. People have always wondered whether you have to be living inside of Israel and you have to be living and near a church in order to get saved. And Paul answers that in Revelation 1. And what he says is, verse 18, the wrath of God, Romans 1, 18, uh, revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men because we suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So, so God says the, the um, come on. Nope, doesn't wanna, there we go. The Native Americans, the Eskimos, and the Aborigines are guilty of something. What are they guilty of? Look at verse 19. What may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them from the creation, verse 20, of the world. His invisible attributes are clearly seen. God says, I have left on the light just enough for you to know I'm there. From the beginning of the world, there is no one that is without excuse. Now, 
my good friend uh, that I trained under always puts it this way. And, and I, I have always thought about this. I, I, in fact, I, I think about it so much that eight times I looked for this, you know, at the birth of each of our children, because what he said is, he says, every child that's born into the world is born holding two candles, the candle of creation and the candle of conscience. I watched through eight births. None of them were holding those candles. But what he was talking is figuratively, metaphorically, you know what I mean, okay. So, so basically, everybody that's born in the world has a candle of creation. And the candle of creation is Romans 1, verse 19. What can be known of God is manifest in them. God has shown them since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. Verse 20 is the candle of creation. Verse 19 is the candle of conscience. And the Lord says, I put, I build into every human that's born a conscience in inside and I build in for them a, an ability to sense creation has a creator. But you know what the Aborigines and the Native Americans and everybody else did? They have verse 19 or verse 18, they have suppressed the truth in unrighteousness. Verse 21, because they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but they became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to become wise, they became fools. Basically, this is the decline and fall of the human race that we find, starting in Romans 1.18 and, and going onward. What, what Paul is saying is that humanity actually did not start as cavemen, grunting and groaning and dragging each other around by hair, you know, like, like the caveman movies. Rather, God created Adam and Eve in his image and, and they had a knowledge, a personal knowledge of God and every generation since then has had that image of God as far as the conscience that we have, this awareness of who God is built into us and we get to see all of the, the huge message of creation. But we suppress it. And, and basically what it, what it is is we blow out our candles. The candle of conscience is blown out because they just keep sinning until they totally sear their conscience. I'm talking about lost people. At first, they're convicted, they feel bad, they think that's wrong, they shouldn't do that, that doesn't, boy, the first lie, the first theft, they just inside of every human, there is the law of God written. He says, I've written it in your hearts, their conscience. It's God's ally. It's, our conscience is an ally of God's. And it's there saying, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do that, that's wrong. And the whole time, there's this full color light and sound show going on, declaring there's a creator. That's what Romans 1 says. By sin, we blow out the candle of our conscience and by evolutionary thought, and, and basically what you read in Romans 1 is creating images made after four-footed creatures and all that. He's talking about idols, making idolatrous gods. They, they blow out both candles. Conscience is blown out by sin, and evolution blows out the creation candle, and then they're totally in the dark and they just descend into further darkness. So what Romans 1 says is that everyone is born with two candles, creation and conscience. Psalm 19 says, a little different angle, that there's this constant broadcast of general revelation through creation and there is this special revelation, this, this word of God that has come. Now, Paul who had mastered the Old Testament and who knew the truths of God from Romans ties these two together as he's doing an evangelistic meeting in Acts 17. So turn back to Acts 17 and you can tell whether you've been at a previous Q&A where I've talked about this because this is the classic moment of, of meeting with people that have not been exposed to the gospel. It's kind of like the Aborigine pygmies and all of that all happening at once. And, and in verse 16, while Paul waited, he saw the city given over to idols. 
And so he's there in verse 17 reasoning. In verse 18, they call him a babbler. Uh, and so they invite him to come up in verse 19 and say, tell us your thing. So Paul is invited before, kind of reminds me of Ravi Zacharias, you know, the uh, Christian apologist going and speaking to some you know, august gathering of scholastic types, like he's invited to speak at Oxford and Cambridge and places like that. So here's Paul, the ultimate apologist. And verse 22, Paul stood in the midst of them, Acts 17, 22, and he, and he references their fact that they had these altars to the unknown God. And he says at the end of uh, uh, 23, therefore the one whom you worship without knowing him I proclaim to you. So Paul's presenting the gospel. And, and it's interesting what he does when Paul, and, and by the way, this is a preview of Lord Willing of next Sunday. This is one of the gospel presentations. We were covering some this morning. This is one of them. How do you present Christ to a highly educated pagan philosophical crowd? Do you try and, you know, get to their level? How do you want to keep from offending them? Um, in fact, I'll never forget, someone came up to me once and they said, what you said on Sunday offended the people we brought to church. You know, they're, they're of, a, of a pagan background and you said their paganism was, you know, wicked and false and everything. And they said, you offended them. What do you have to say for yourself? I said, I'm glad they were listening. <laughs> because the model is, look what Paul does. He, he doesn't just offend them, he angers them. Because he doesn't, he doesn't step back from the truth. He's like Jesus Christ. When Jesus was facing the skeptical Pharisees and Sadducees who already wanted to stone him, he takes steps toward them and he digs it in. He, he emphasizes it, the truth of who he was. He doesn't say, come on guys, calm down. You know, he says, no, not only am I God, I am the one that made the Sabbath day. Oh, that just made him matter. So what does Paul do? Look at this. He says, God, verse 24, who made the world and everything in it. Number one, he says, there is a creator, whether you believe it or not, whether you know it or not. In fact, it's amazing that that's the first thing that Paul starts with, creation. In fact, when God himself is preaching the gospel in the tribulation, in in the height of the tribulation when 100 pound hailstones are crushing humans, when, when it is the worst time and the sun is scorching them, God sends an angel. You know what the angel pre preaches? There's a creator. And you need to bow to the creator. There is a creator. You did not come from slime. You were made by a creator. It's, it's a very interesting initial Gospel presentation, God who made the world and everything in it since he is Lord of heaven and earth doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. Boy, that bothered them. Their whole city, that's all it was is these most, we still go there, right? Doesn't uh, all the tour magazines, don't they have pictures of the Acropolis? That's just a little vestige of all those temples they had. That was their life. That was their pride. Everything they had were in these temples. He says, none of your gods are real because the real living God doesn't live in those places that you guys have made. Very offensive. Nor is he worshiped with man's hands, verse 25, as though he needed anything, since he gives all life and breath to all things. And he is made from one blood. There goes any shred of prejudice. See, Paul was proclaiming a lot of truth. And he says, you know what? There aren't three races, and there isn't a lower, you know, subhuman race that's, you know, supposed to be the servant class of the world and enslaved. He says, there's just one blood. There's only one human race. And it's interesting, you know, the, that God has never been prejudiced, even though a lot of humans in the name of Christ have been. But he's made from one blood every nation of men to dwell in the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwelling. But here's the gospel. And Sarah, you knew I was going to get to it, didn't you? It's in verse 27. After he talks about the creator, and after he talks about the fact that, that he is really the, the sovereign over all, he is the, the, the one who is ruling, it says that he places who is living where, at what time period. Paul introduces him and says there's no idols uh, that are real. But verse 27 
so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each of us. Paul presents the human race as all being in this dark, kind of like crashing plane. And he said, God is not at the exit door 83 rows up, you know, if you're in one of those A380 new Airbuses that have five or six or 700 people on it. He's not 38 rows in the front. He, look what it says in, in verse 27, that he's close enough that if you grope, you know what grope is? It's how far your arm can reach. A grope is someone that is close enough to touch. They're within an arm's length. What he's saying is, this is, and this is what I would, Sarah, if I was talking to your friend, I'd say God claims to be God is within an arm's reach. An arm's reach of every human that's ever lived. Whether they're an Aborigine, a Native American, an Aborigine, or they lived in the heart of Africa in the first century of the Roman Empire. God himself, Paul says, he has, he has made himself so that he is not far from each one of us, 27 ends. He is within an arm's reach of everyone. Now there is the gospel. There is the God we serve. The God who is broadcasting 24-7, 365 through creation, who has revealed himself very clearly and has given everybody, as they're born, he issues them two standard candles. If they'll just hold them up, they'll light the way, the light of creation and the light of their conscience within. What is he lighting up? That he's within an arm's reach. If you'll just reach out for him. He said, well, keep reading. You can see what he said. He is not far from each of us, for in him we live and move and have our beings, as also one of your own poets have said, for we are his offspring. And since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, verse 29 says. Truly the times of ignorance God has overlooked, but now commends all men everywhere to repent. Now, you know what's interesting? What God, what what response God accepted to save someone? Now, salvation has always been the same. A substitute had to pay the penalty for the sin. God has never wavered from that, and Christ has always been the only substitute. But what did it take to, to get in on the substitution? Well, did you know when Jonah preached to similar pagan peoples. If you read Jonah, do you remember how long his gospel message was? Eight words. Yet 40 days, and Nineveh will perish. Eight words. It was, it was the simplest evangelistic message of all time. God is going to destroy you. You better do something. You better reach out for him. And everybody that reached out it says that they, the whole city, if you read the book of Jonah, the whole city, sackcloth, mourning over their... I mean, that city was rife with the occult, with murder, uh, cruelty. I mean, you can read the description of Nineveh. Horrible place. Astrology. All kinds of black arts. Yet the people, they had their little candle of conscience and they knew what they were doing wasn't right. And they knew there was something out there and they, when they heard he was going to destroy them, they humbled themselves. Now, yes, salvation is of the Lord. That's in the book of Jonah 2, verse 9 of chapter 2. But God wanted them to reach out. He said, I'm within an arm's reach. And so he revealed himself. That's when Jonah spoke the word of God, that was special revelation. So back to the conclusion about how all these people get saved. What Paul said is, from the creation, from the, the, the Lord that made the world, has from the beginning only been an arm's reach away from everybody. However many billions of people have lived on this world, their creator 
has been within reach of every one of them. There is no one that's ever lived without God himself promising that, that he is, the first verse of, of Psalm 19 is, Hashemayim Masafrim kavod el la la le la la. It's a beautiful in Hebrew. And what it's saying is God is bubbling forth the knowledge of himself. His glorious knowledge is going everywhere and it's in every language. It's better than Google. God is, is speaking to everyone and he speaks to them through creation. He speaks to them through the conscience and he stands within an arm's length of them. But even when God himself came down visibly and was within an arm's length, Jesus Christ. What did people do? They hated him. They hated. Did you know that the Sadducees and the Pharisees never said Jesus didn't do all those miracles? They never claimed that, that he didn't do, that he didn't, they didn't say you didn't raise them from the dead. They didn't say you didn't feed 5,000 people. They didn't say you didn't calm the, the Sea of Galilee. They just hated him. You see, apart from God, and now it sounds like you're in our car because this is what we were talking about on the way over here. Apart from God quickening our hearts, we all are so much like our father the devil that we hate the light. That's what John 1, if you, if you wanna, I mean, what I'm saying is you can string together all the scriptures. John 1 says, we were born wired to love the darkness, not the light. Jesus is the light. He's not far from any of us. He's the light of the world. He lights everyone that comes into the world, which is a restatement of Psalm 19. He is one, he's lighting, he's putting a candle in every hand. He's, he's, he's saying, I'm right here, I'm just an arm's length away. But we are so, Joseph Conrad, you know, the, the great literary author wrote a book once called The Heart of Darkness. That, that is a fitting description of humanity. We have such darkness of heart that even if God himself walked on earth as the light of the world, he still engenders in the human heart hatred if he doesn't soften that heart. That's why anybody, any of us that are saved is all the mercy and grace of God because we weren't born looking for him, but he has been looking. He came into the world to seek and to save the lost. Now you can, you know, try and make that not say very much, but Jesus just blankly, he didn't say, and I don't mean I only came to seek, you know, the elect. He said, I came because I so love the world that whoever believes in me, and I believe that he offers salvation to all, even though all will not and never could respond to him. But he's only an arm's length away. And, and I know it's, now we're getting into sovereignty of God and, and everything else. So John 1 says he lights everybody, but how, how do we get to uh, who makes it to heaven and who doesn't? And I'll end with this, Sarah. You've got, you win for the longest question tonight, so... That's because you're off in college and so smart. But look at uh, chapter 20 of Revelation. And I saw a great white throne and he who sat on it from whose face heaven and earth, verse 11 says, fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead small and great. So basically what the Bible says is that every Native American, every Eskimo, every Aborigine, and every Assyrian and every, you know, everybody that's ever lived, pre-flood, post-flood, Old Testament, New Testament, heart of Africa, some island out, you know, the Aleutian Islands, they're all gonna be resurrected and they're going to stand in front of God. And look, the books were opened and another book was opened, but what were the dead judged by? According to their works, what was written in the books, verse 12. You see, the bottom line is nobody goes to hell because they didn't hear about Jesus. No one goes to hell. No one goes to hell because they didn't hear about Jesus. They go to hell. So it isn't that you've never heard the name Jesus that you go to hell. People 
go to hell, God says. Hell is because of sin. And everyone's a sinner. And that is the reason why people go to hell. Because if you die, if I die with my sin on me, then the wrath of God is forever revealed against sin. God's wrath is going to forever be consuming. I am going to be suffering continuously because I am a sinner. That's what the Bible says. The only hope is Christ. And he's only an arm's length away from everybody. And if God could reroute Jonah from going to Spain and get him to Nineveh in the Fertile Crescent between the Tigris and Euphrates area, you can be sure that anybody throughout all history who has reached out for God, he has gotten the gospel to them because he's more concerned about it than we are. And that's the blessing. But what was our, uh, Sarah, did I say enough? Because we have to send off. You're so kind. Look at that. Uh, we're going to have to come back to uh, Jordan. Oh, was that you, Jordan? Was that you? Is it Jordan? Which one? Yeah, there you are. Next week, okay, Lord willing, we'll come back here and talk about Joseph and Egypt and everything.